this week on the Back Table Podcast. The osteoporotic population is growing more quickly than any other population, diabetes or anything else like that. Is that still true? You know, I tell my fellow, I have a fellowship training program, as you well know, as a future fellow. My current fellow, I tell all of them the same thing. If you don't like old people medicine, you better start liking it because you go back 10 years and forward 10 years, over 65 patient population doubles. You go from 1960 to 2030, the increase is 4.2 times. This is enormous demographic. This is the biggest demographic we have. We talk about rates of diabetes, obesity, you know, heart disease, uh, opioid overdose, pales in comparison to the over 65. And people over 65 have problems that over 65 patients have. They is We're living longer, it's dichotomous. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Backtable MSK Podcast, your source for all things musculoskeletal. You can find all previous episodes of our show on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and on Backtable.com. This is your host, Jacob Fleming, broadcasting from Dallas, Texas, amidst Ice Apocalypse 2022. And today I'm honored to be joined by someone I'm lucky to call a mentor, longtime friend of the podcast. And the Kaifo King himself, Doug Beal. Dr. Beal, welcome back to the show. Thanks, Jacob. Great to be with you. I should probably disclose that Dr. Beal is my future program director, and I'm contractually obligated to call him the Kaifo King in public forums. Uh, so the audience should probably know that potential bias. <laughs> so before, before we start, I do want to recommend that our audience give a listen to Dr. Beal's first appearance on the podcast back in episode 94 which is still one of my favorite episodes. Speaking from experience, a lot of people heard that podcast and were just blown away to hear about a lot of the things in interventional spine that are a little out of the mainstream for IR. And one of the things I was very curious about when I heard that episode was, how do you manage to do it all? Uh, not only are you employing these cutting edge techniques, you really take ownership of the patient from head to toe and follow them longitudinally. So when I had the chance to visit your practice, I was really impressed with just how well everything comes together. To me, it is very clear that uh, your practice has been built around a mission. So I was hoping you could tell our listeners about your practice and what you consider to be your personal mission in medicine. The background, as you know, Jacob, comes from uh, minimally invasive treatments of all kinds. So it's one of the issues that we have whenever we start treating patients is we are coming at it from a diagnostic and treatment perspective. So what we have is a see and treat machine. This is, is somewhat of a circular referral pattern. So we see patients, we are able to diagnose, let's say a, a vertebral fracture, and this is pretty easy. And the ability to diagnose and treat that patient is one of the things that is a knee jerk reflex almost at this point in time, but it's not necessarily the right way to do that. Meaning that if your grandmother came to me and I were to diagnose the fracture and get her treated promptly, that would be great. And we would be fairly happy. But if your grandmother had another fracture or if she had a preceding hip fracture, or if she has another problem like spinal stenosis, and that just kind of got glossed over, it would go from a, a see and treat machine in terms of a one step process to being dissatisfied in the end. So the way that we have our practice set up is uh, it, it, I have a private practice, and so this sounds a little corny and, uh, to say, but it's it's absolutely true that you, we make our success one patient at a time. And so early on, we started treating patients, and you know, I talked to people about doing treating vertebral compression fractures, and they say, well, yeah, you know, I do kyphoplasty, but that, that's not really what we're after. From my perspective, I don't just do kyphoplasty. Of course we do kyphoplasty, but we don't just do that. So what we do is we treat patients with vertebral compression fractures. And what's, what that means is, and I have to say this, and this, I say if your grandmother has a fracture, she comes see me because we do it better. And what I mean by that is, is that we see the patient, we're experts at diagnosis, of course. We're also experts at treatment, meaning we have all types of vertebral augmentation available to us all the way from mechanical augmentation, spine jack, and including something as simple as a vertebral plasty, which absolutely still has its place. We see them, we measure their, their T-score, 
a DEXA scan, and it depends on what kind of fracture they have. We don't, I don't really care. And so if, uh, if the person we treated fractured two levels picking up a shoe box, we know already that they have osteoporosis. And so we, we treat them for that. We do the DEXA scan simply as a benchmark for treatment, not because we're questioning the diagnosis. Because apart from having a, having multiple myeloma or a neoplastic involvement or some type of discitis in there that we're unsuspecting, it's diagnostic of osteoporosis, fragility fracture. And so we figure out exactly what their issue is, treat them to completion, and then any other ancillary issues, we help them with those too. But the primary problem is solved not only from a procedural standpoint, but we treat the underlying disorder so they can do well and they pers they persistently do well. And in 2022, we have three anabolic bone agents that are almost, almost or completely curative of that problem. And so the ability to kind of ignore this and gloss over it, you know, I consider not appropriate. But what we do, going back to the initial point, is we treat the patient with vertebral compression fractures. We treat them through the whole thing. And to no surprise, we get really good outcomes, fantastic outcomes because of it. That's fantastic. I think everything you describe really illustrates the, the positive effect it can have for interventional radiologists really owning the entire disease state and just really providing an excellent service to the community. And I do want to nail down on talking about the anabolic bone agents and, and kind of your practice's algorithm. One thing I want to take a step back and just talk a little bit about the fundamentals of osteoporosis. So this is something that as physicians and especially radiologists, we're definitely aware of, especially on a technical level uh, when it comes to the imaging. And yet some of the data uh, I've, I've seen or heard from you seems to paint a different picture with regard to how physicians are dropping the ball with diagnosis and management of osteoporosis. Whenever people talk to me, they, they say, well, I hear you treat osteoporosis and say, well, I really don't treat osteoporosis. I treat people's bone problems so they don't die early and suffer lots of morbidity. So let me give you a couple of examples. So people with vertebral compression fractures die at a rate of 8.6 times need to match controls. And that's from the FIT trial. That's, that's called the Osteoporosis International. And they do so based on deconditioning. It's not because like a high speed level one fat in blighted lungs, people primarily die of pneumonia. 90% of people die of pneumonia. Wow. Each vertebral fracture is associated with the same relative risk of mortality. It's about the same as a hip fracture. The difference between spine and hip fractures, you can walk with a spine fracture. You can't walk with a hip fracture. So it's easier to recognize. And so the ability to treat somebody in terms of their bone problem is absolutely essential. And if you, if you have somebody with a hip fracture, you've got to stabilize the gaminella sliding screw or whatever. Same with the, the spine fracture. If they're sufficiently deconditioned or sufficiently painful, because that person will not do well short of treatment. So Kevin Ong, Josh Hirsch and I did a, a trial with uh, a meta analysis um, of, it was really a claims based analysis focused on 10 years of Medicare data set, 30 million patients. There were a 10 year time period. We took the entire Medicare data set and out of that, there were 2,077,000 fractures. The 10 year mortality patient, the 10 year mortality rate of those patients was 85.1%. So it has to do with the function of age because most of them were old. My average person who gets a fracture is a 75 year old thin Caucasian female, Northern European descent, three, eight comorbidities. That has to be taken into consideration, but also the mortality reduction for patients that were treated, that, that we had patients were treated with non-surgical management, so-called conservative uh, treatment, air quotes, is it's really not that conservative, mainly because if you treat somebody with a painful fracture with vertebroplasty, you reduce their mortality 24%. If you treat somebody with kyphoplasty, you reduce their mortality 55%. So let me give you a comparator on that. Jacob, so we had, I remember back in the day when people were treating with just anti-resorptives and Ballin had a great meta-analysis. He said, if you treat people with just anti-resorptives, the kind of the, the least effective of, of all the medication categories, 
you're able to reduce mortality in his meta-analysis by 11%, which is impressive in and of itself. So this kind of played out in the, uh, the editorial page in the New England Journal. Authors Stein and Ray were saying, well, if we're able to reduce the mortality rate by 11%, just treating patients' osteoporosis, maybe we should rethink placebo-controlled trials for anti-osteoporotics. It's probably right. And so now that explains why in drug trials now, it's, it's unusual to have a study in the United States compared to an active comparator to use a placebo because, you know, it's kind of the Helsinki doctrine of, of if you, you can use a placebo, if you don't knowingly do harm to a patient. And if you're giving a placebo compared to something that provides an 11% mortality reduction, that may be doing them harm. And that's the point the Stein Ray was trying to make. And I agree with that. Well, what, what about 55% mortality reduction? It, should we be doing a placebo controlled trial, a sham trial, when we know that patients get a 55% mortality reduction, which is exactly what we found in the trial that we published with 2,077,000 fractures. So this is kind of from a, a wide scope and scale uh, of treating patients' underlying disorder, this is incumbent on a wide scale. So the area that we operate in, of course, is so much easier <laughs> than, than the primary care and endocrine area. We don't, I don't see patients for, that come in with three to eight comorbidities and a, and a laundry list of problems as a primary care physician. I see patients that are primarily referred to me specifically for the vertebral fracture, specifically for the repair. And I'm able to, by definition, I know they have, they're at very high risk of fracture. The vast majority of these have a T-score of minus 2.5 or more negative than that. They all come in with the vertebral compression fracture, which is a, the regardless of T-score is a defining event. Grandma falls down from a standing height, breaks her L1. I don't care what her T-score is. According to the criteria, you know it's a fragility fracture, you sure about it, and you go on to treat the fracture and then treat the underlying disorder. Less than 5% of the people I see are being treated for osteoporosis. Very few people have been screened. And I saw an article this week that said the reduction in DEXA scanning over the past decade is, has been 66% reduction and, and billing for DEXA scanning, which means that uh, there are far fewer people are getting screened, fewer people getting screened, few, fewer people being diagnosed. The awareness of this disease process and something that is critically important is very poor. And there's, you know, there's essentially two things we do in medicine that are demonstrably life-saving and life-prolonging. You ready for those two things, Jacob? There's two things. Let's hear them. And you know what I'm going to say because you've been here and you've heard this and they're hip fracture repair, spine fracture repair. We talk about even breast cancer screening is hard to prove a mortality benefit. And angioplasty and stent placement, no, it's, it's hard to prove. We, in the same paper that I described, we calculated a number of uh, patients needed to treat to save a life. We submitted this to AJR. And they rejected the paper. <laughs> and I emailed Jeff Ross, the editor, said, Jeff, I think they didn't really understand what we were trying to do that, here. And he said, I agree. I want you to make a few modifications in the paper to make it more clear about what you're trying to let less uh, statistic driven. And he said, I want you to name the paper what you're trying, trying to accomplish here in terms just of the messaging. And I said, well, what if we call it the number of patients needed to treat to save a life? And he said, perfect, do that. So we looked at a comparison of a male over 50 for a stroke and heart attack to ameliorate an, one aspirin a day to ameliorate symptoms of a stroke or heart attack. For a stroke, it was 3,000 patients needed to treat to ameliorate symptoms of a stroke. For a heart attack, it was 1,667 patients needed to treat an aspirin a day to ameliorate symptoms of that heart attack. For the number of patients needed to treat to save somebody's life for a vertebral compression fracture, 15. So statistically, thank you very much because for every 15 patients you're treating, you save somebody's life at one year. At five years, it goes down to 12. So this is one of the things we do that really is life sustaining and prolonging 
Ovid and in his paper calculated the life benefit is between 2.2 and 7.3 years per patient. Why in the world would you do somebody a durable benefit like that to sustain and prolong their life and not treat the underlying disorder that produced it? If your cardiologist, your father's cardiologist, treated, gave him an angioplasty and stent placement and ignored the fact that his triglycerides were 500 or his cholesterol was 400, just blew it off, ah, it's fine, he'll be fine. You, you would be unhappy, right? If my mother goes in, she's visiting another city and happened to have a, and, and I know this is a shocker, but my mother is a, is a uh, then Caucasian female, Northern European descent over the age of 75, right? And she, she fell down, broke her hip, and somebody put a gamma nail on a sliding screw or a total hip arthroplasty, depending on the type of fracture, and didn't talk to her about it, the, the fact that her T-score was a minus 3.7 and she sustained that hip fracture from a fall from a standing height. I would be unhappy. But yet, this is what happens all day, every day. Let me give you an example. November of 2002, we had teriparatide the first anabolic bone agent. At that time in 2002, the number of patients being treated for their underlying disorder after hip fracture was 40%. And that's bad. I think it should be as close to 100 as we can possibly get, because as I mentioned, you know, hip fracture is easy. No, but you can't walk with it. You're, you're there, your legs, internal rotation, foreshortened, acute pain, can't bear weight, fall from a standing height on the greater trochanter, Hip snaps, no great diagnostic brilliance to understand that that's a major fragility fracture that needs to be treated, the underlying disorder. You go forward to 2011, that number goes from 40 to 20, half the number of people. I saw an article published in 2018 by Desai that says now there's 3% of people being treated for their underlying disorder. So November 2002, we had the teriparatide. April of 2017, we had a uh an excellent anabolic bone agent. These are trade name Forteo and Timlos, respectively. April of 2019, Romazosumab. This is called Avenity, a three anabolic bone agent. So now, ironically, we're better equipped to treat patients than ever before, but we're not employing that at all in a condition that is easily now known, much better known, because every single paper that I've, I've quoted in terms of morbidity, mortality, and risk reduction, and effectiveness of kyphoplasty and underlying treatment has been published since the advent of the first antibiotic bone agent. So we didn't know. So ironically, we were doing better when we knew far less than what we know now, and we're doing far worse knowing a lot more than we did then. And this is uh, inexplicable to me. And I think and that I say that this at the risk of probably offending some people in our especially, but it's our responsibility to treat these people. It's not the primary care guy's responsibility. Why don't you trade places with him, you know, work in some, you know, closed room shop, seeing 40 patients a day, having somebody look over your shoulder and make sure you're tapping things into the EMR correctly. And you got a laundry list of eight problems per patient. No, I mean, we're in the scenario is that we really understand this and we should understand the treatment, but we should also under understand the treatment on the back end. You know, this is something that we're not taught in our fellowship. We're not taught in residency. We're not even taught in this in medical schools. A lot of these medications will come out after we've already completed training. All of them came out after all the anabolics, after I completed training. But it turns out that, you know, smart people can learn this stuff. And if you can make it through residency and fellowship and be a successful practicing interventional radiologist, I would submit to you that it's not beyond the pale that you can learn this too. And you can, can become an expert in it because we're already an expert at treating spine fractures. Why not an expert at preventing them as well? And this is something that is really, we are leaving this on the table and it's, it's not appropriate because look, here's a news flash to, to the rest of the specialty. Primary care, not going to treat them. They're just not. And they're, they're not comfortable with anabolic bone agents. The average rate of reduction of additional fractures varies from, you know, 68 to 86% from teriparatide to baliparatide. So this is profound. So you can't 
You can't talk to patients like that. And if you're going to convince them to do an anabolic, you have to say, here's why I want you to do it. We're, we're, we are trying to be curative about this, but I want you to do it. And so this really needs to come from the treating physician because there's, there's been work done uh, for orthopedics out of the orthopedic literature that says if the discussion about treating underlying osteoporosis comes from the treating physician, treats the fracture, there's a significantly greater uptake in adoption of this by the patient and the compliance of the patient staying on the medication than if it comes from somebody else. It's, it's huge, uh, the, the kind of gains that you're talking about there, especially for some of the reasons you alluded to earlier. Osteoporosis is such a societal burden, uh, as you illustrated earlier, the rates of diagnosis and treatment are getting worse, not better. And I agree with what you're saying. I don't think it's fair to basically turf this to the, the PCPs, the community doctors and say, this is a, you know, this is a primary care issue. So I really, I think it's absolutely our responsibility and I, I have no trouble convincing people to do this. And the, the other important component of that is as a radiologist, I could barely spell the word medication. But I, I try and I tell the patient, you know, I'm doing this to improve your outcome. I'm not doing this to give you a medication. We're improving this to improve your pain, your function. We're doing this to prevent an additional fracture. And we know that this to be true. So if you can do two years of PTH analog, bump their bone mineral density up 12%, decrease their rate of adjacent or additional fracture almost 90%. Why wouldn't you do that? And if you can combine that with another two years of alendronate, you take that 12%, you buff it up to about 18%. That's a category and a half of DEXA scan. If you take that two years of, let's say, baloperatide, Timlos, you knock that, you knock it out of the park 12%, you give them a year of romazosumab, Venity. I've got, if you follow me on Twitter and LinkedIn, and I know you've seen some of these posts, I've got you know 23%, 26%. Yeah. 30% it's huge. increase in bone density. That's, you know, it's two, two plus categories, two and a half categories, you know, and, and, uh, one of these things, and this is heresy to our, our, our colleagues. So what I'm about ready to say is heresy. Are you, are you ready for it? Let's hear it. If you take the bone density and you bump it up almost 30% and the T-score is normal and the patient hasn't suffered a fracture. I would say the osteoporosis has been treated and is gone. The old adage that once osteoporosis, always osteoporosis, I don't think is correct. What we're after is curative therapy. And with the medications and the agents we have now, we are able to get curative therapy. And what happens is I treat them episodically, two plus two or two plus one, because uh, Avenity is given one year, that Lindernate is given for two years. I'm quoting uh, the first one, two plus two is the active extend trial published by the aptly named Henry Bone. <laughs> we'll make that up, no, right? I can't make it up. Uh, and that is, is Paul Miller, Fisher Cosman, and Henry Bone. And, and then the second one is, is not published data. These are, this is using uh, Avenity uh, after Timlos primarily. And then once, once we've treated their osteoporosis, you know, take them off their medications and put them back to screening every two to five years. And many people, after having taken calcium and vitamin D, just don't feel comfortable. They I, apparently become emotionally attached to their vitamin D and just don't want to. And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm not opposed to that, but I kind of lower it. I take it from average of 5,000 units a day down to uh, 1,000 to 2,000 international units based on where the vitamin D level is and just kind of leave them on that. But that's, you know, in, there, there are very few people, there's nothing you can do about hypercholesterolemia. You stop taking your anti-hypercholesterolemic drug, it goes back up. Hypertension, same thing. Get off your anti-hypertensive, it goes back up. Osteoporosis, you treat it and you keep it. You keep that benefit forever. And sure, it will trundle down because the x-axis on the DEXA scan is age. And it sure will trundle down over time. But once you bump it back up, I said this is age and it goes down over time. Increase your bone marital density 20% percent is like de-aging your bones 30 years. Trace it back. And patients can understand that and they, they like that. And once we're finished, put them back on the screening, I send them back out. You know, and it's, and it's meaning episodic treatment. Once we've accomplished the goal of treating a fracture, 
treating their underlying bone mineral density, that's it. You call me if you need me. As you said, we own the disease state. We understand the diagnosis, the interventional treatment. And so it just, it makes sense to add on the medication aspect of it. It's not rocket surgery. And you're, you're kind of offering the whole package. And uh, that, that's so huge, I think, especially in um, a lecture I heard from you a while ago. I think you discussed, and I'm, I'm curious if this is still the case. I think it probably is that the osteoporotic population is growing more quickly than any other population, diabetes or anything else like that. Is that still true? You know, I tell my fellow, I have a fellowship training program, as you well know, as a future fellow, my current fellow, I tell all of them the same thing. If you don't like old people medicine, you better start liking it because you go back 10 years and forward 10 years, over 65 patient population doubles. You go from 1960 to 2030, the increase is 4.2 times. This is enormous demographic. This is the biggest demographic we have. We talk about rates of diabetes, obesity, you know, heart disease, opioid overdose, pales in comparison to the over 65. And people over 65 have problems that over 65 patients have. They is we're living longer. It's dichotomous. So I, I treated a patient this week, saw a patient Monday, and she's 86. Talked to her about anabolic bone ages. I kind of, I struggle with this. And often I say, you know, borderline inappropriate things to patients that I love to do. Like, like well, how much longer are you going to live? And because, you know, you're 86, you get a little hypertension, you're, lo you're shooting at three digits. And I've, I learned early on, I had a, a lady that was 82, said, uh, you know, because one of the best estimates of life expectancy is age of same sex parent plus five years, provided they don't get cancer, trauma, something like this. I said, well, how long did your, did your mother live? She said, oh, well, um, mom's 102. <laughs> like, that's still a lot. Still like, kicking. Oh, okay. Well, I guess, guess that answers that question. Mm -hmm. But, you know, there's so a lady, so 86 year old. Caucasian female, a little bit of hypertension, fixed three of her spine fractures, mid thoracic spine, recovered very quickly from the impending pneumonia that was about ready to take her down and loosen her grip on the edge of the sink to go down. And so she's doing well. And so, you know, I, I wonder, should I treat this person with an anabolic bone agent or not for, you know, 14 years of life? Because that's kind of what I'm expecting. And, but what's likely to take her down is a hip fracture. I mean, right. That's, that's, that's what's likely that she's, she'll be putting around 93, 94. She's still doing great, living independently, fall down, break her hip and, you know, be found later on, uh, not able to get to the phone or, you know, just uh, start the cascade of, of, uh, deconditioning. So what's, who has a greater life expectancy, her or my 58 year old, hundred pound overweight male hypercholesterolemic smoker that doesn't do anything I tell him to, well, you know, probably the first patient. So it's, it's difficult to know exactly what to try to do the right thing, but this patient population, we, the people we have are dichotomous. I mean, either they die early uh, of some of the conditions of modern society, or they tend to do pretty well and they get life-saving things like hip and spine fracture repairs. Maybe they have a bypass and never have that heart attack that was impending and you know, the, we, we're seeing lots of people that are able to live really good quality life uh, later on. And I tell them, that, like, look, I, I'm not treating your fracture. I'm not giving you uh, underlying anabolic bone age for you to just sit around. I mean, I, I, I want you up and around. I want you to be a productive member of society. And I kind of want you to, to be able to live out the rest of your life. And, you know, if, if, if you die of doing something totally inappropriate at age 101, and get caught doing it and it's a disaster and you end up uh, dying for that way, then, then I'll consider our treatment a success. That concludes part one with Dr. Doug Beal. Stay tuned for part two coming out soon. Thank you so much for listening. If you haven't already, make sure to subscribe, rate the podcast five stars, and share with a friend. If you have any questions or comments, direct message us at underscore Backtable MSK on Instagram, Twitter, or LinkedIn. Backtable is produced and hosted by myself, Jacob Fleming, and co-hosts Michael Barraza and Chris Beck. Our audio team is led by Kieran Gannon with support from Josh McWhirter, Aaron Bowles, Nick Shellcross, and Ness Smith-Savadoff. 
Design and Digital Marketing, led by Brian Schmitz. Social media and show notes written by Marvi Espiritu and Anne Dang. Administrative support provided by Jim Willie Thanks again, and see you next time.